In today's show, we'll recap the Blazers' loss to the Pelicans, a team that's just not very good in the clutch. We'll look at that loss in New Orleans and unpack the numbers behind the worst fourth quarter defense in the NBA. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You are listening to another episode of Locked on Blazers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts, and now also on YouTube. If you're listening to my voice and haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, do me a favor. Go ahead and do that right now. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Blazers. We're trying to get to 2,000 subscribers by 2022. We're pushing towards 1,700 uh, 300 of you in the next week. If you could jump on there, we would meet our goal. Cannot do it without your help. So if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. In today's show, we're talking about the Blazers lost in New Orleans Pelicans. Unpack some uh, clutch statistics, how the Blazers have fared in the fourth quarter and when the game is on the line in crunch time. And then we'll close the show looking around the league. Um, j- just the latest news from uh, health and safety protocols, et cetera, and where the league is headed as we head into Christmas week or as we're in the midst of Christmas week. But before we do that, it's time for what we do. The fastest recap in the West. The Blazers lose 111-97 to the New Orleans Pelicans. They were down 24-21 after one. It was a slog early in the first quarter. Both teams only had five points in the first five minutes. It, it was a little bit ugly, but Blazers were right in it. Um, as ugly as it was for Portland, it was equally ugly, equally slow start for the New Orleans Pelicans. They were down, Blazers down 24-21 after one. They're down 51-49 at halftime. Damian Lord, huge second quarter, scored 15 of his 22 first half points in the second quarter. Seven in the first quarter is a lot, right? Like that's on pace for 28, but 15 in the second quarter. The problem was Brandon Ingram had 14 for the Pelicans. Uh, he came on, he got hot late, got, got loose late, and the uh, Blazers were down 51-49 at the half. In the third quarter, Blazers didn't cut into the lead, but they didn't fall further behind. They head into the fourth quarter down 81-79. Norman Powell had 12 points in the third quarter. Pelicans led by many as, as many as 13 in the third. Really, really brutal first couple minutes to the second half for the Blazers, but they fought back, stayed in it, down two after three, right, right in the right spot. Except Nikhil Alexander-Walker had 18 points in the fourth quarter. Portland Trail Blazers had 19. Uh, the fourth quarter opened with... Uh, Alexander Walker getting a, a zone buster for three from the corner, then an elevator doors three where Ben McLemore was just trailing and ran into both screens, and then Nikhil Alexander Walker getting loose in the corner, uh, getting a little bit, a little bit too much space given to him by Norman Powell. He hits a three. He started five for five and hit three threes in the first three minutes and fifty three seconds of the fourth quarter and put the Pelicans up nine with eight minutes and fifty three seconds left. It's it was a little bit troublesome, you know, down nine, but the Blazers didn't go away. Like they were, they were, you know, from a, from a two point game to a nine point game. And you're kind of in scramble mode within the last nine minutes, but you're certainly within striking distance. And when Damian Lillard hit a three with six minutes and 52 seconds left, the Blazers found themselves down 92, 91. It was, they were there. They, they had their moments. So they had a moment right there, seven minutes down one time to win the game. And the Pelicans ripped off seven straight points and pushed the lead back to eight. Uh, Norman Powell turned the ball over. Ben McLemore missed a it pump fake flyby and then stepped deeper into the corner and missed a three. He misses. Pels go the other way. Nikhil Alexander-Walker hits another one. Pelicans rip off that 7-0 run and go back up eight. And that's how they win because the Blazers never got closer than that. 111-97. Blazers were never closer than six in the final four minutes. Uh that's how that is how you lose, um, and that's how you end up now two and twelve on the road. And it spoiled just another monster night from Dame. You may recall from the last podcast that Dame back, but the problem is that nobody came with him. Uh, Thirty nine points and seven assists for Dame. Uh, shout, shout out to Reader Jamar who told me not to call assists dimes, uh, but I'll say Dame also had seven seven dimes because I don't listen to feedback super quickly always. Seventeen points from Yusuf Nurkic. Um, not a great Nurk game, and he didn't play down the stretch, but he was he was. Was good early, um, and I I thought this wasn't a this was not a bad Nurk game. He finished his box score probably looks better than than his actual effectiveness. He finished with 17 points, five boards, two assists, 
two steals and a block. Also turned the ball over three times and had five turnovers. Norman Powell, 16 points on six of 14. He never really got it going. Larry Nance had 10, six rebounds, uh, two steals, four or two assists, four steals. And uh, the problem was the bench, right? Like the problem wasn't the starters. That group was fine. Uh, Nazir Little did not play in this game, missed the night with uh, – uh, non-COVID illness, uh, probably some sort of flu-like symptoms. Tony Snell started and went 0 for 1, scoreless in 18 minutes, 0 for 1 from the field, rebounded the ball three times, had a steal on a block. It's what Tony Snell does. Um, Blaze didn't get a ton of um, big production off the bench, and particularly Ant. Like, Simons, every time he's had was one of nine and missed his first eight shots um, and finished with two points on one of nine shooting in 31 minutes. Like, he just – Ant had a bad game. I, there's, I'm, it's what happened. Ant, Ant played poorly, and they needed him to play well. Ben McLemore, two of seven from deep, all all seven of the shots are threes. Robert Covington, one of five from three, finished with seven points. I, I don't think Cuff was super bad, but he was um, – they, they could have used him to hit – you know, he goes two for five from three. We're talking about a good game from Cuff. It, he went one for five, felt like a bad one. On the other end, the Blazers just had no answer. Nikhil Alexander Walker, 27 points, 18 in the fourth quarter to put this one away. Again, he had 18 in the fourth. The Blazers had 19. That's you're just not going to win many of those. Brandon Ingram finished with 28, 8, and 8. Uh, Josh Hart had 20 and just punished the Blazers in transition. The Blazers are a bad transition defense, and Josh Hart at every possible opportunity reminded them of that by running down their throats and getting either putting pressure on them or getting a layup. Um, this was this was a it was this was a disheartening loss because the Blazers had won two in a row and they'd won a nice game in Memphis where they had been you know it had been a close game and they won it in the final two minutes by making plays they it's a, a frustrating loss because Dame had 39 points and you still lose it's a frustrating loss because the Pelicans are just a straight up bad basketball team uh, you know they came into the night 10 and 21 and just five and nine at home and the Blazers couldn't handle them in the fourth quarter you get you know. It, the difference in a, in a bad basketball team and, and and the good basketball teams is, is you know, something like 11 minutes. The difference in sort of a mediocre basketball team like the Blazers trending towards bad and a bad basketball team is like six minutes and the Blazers couldn't win in the final six minutes. Um, this was... This was just a night where the Blazers needed someone else to step up, and really that someone else has got to be Norm or Ant, and neither of those dudes had a monster offensive game. Uh, you didn't get a special night from anyone else on the roster, and you end up with a disheartening loss, and it continues a trend for me. Against the Pelicans, the Bla or excuse me, against the Memphis Grizzlies, the Blazers were won a game in the clutch, right? It, it came down to the final few minutes. Damon Lillard was special. Norman Powell hit two big shots off Dame assists, uh, and they, they won a game that was close in the closing minutes. An, an important and impressive win. But that is not the trend. The trend is the Blazers struggling in the fourth quarter. And what I want to do in the second segment is unpack those struggles. They've got some, they've, they've had some bad moments late. And um, last season, they were the best team in the clutch. This, this season, they are trending towards one of the worst. Let's unpack those numbers. And a reason behind why the Blazers are where they are is because the magic of close games that, that carried them so much of last season has not translated to this year. We'll unpack those, all of those numbers in the second segment. But first, let's talk about calm. When it comes to athletes, we tend to focus on physical fitness, but there's another side to the game and it's just as important. It's mental fitness. And Calm is the number one app for sleep and meditation. And they help you train your brain to become a championship version of yourself. Calm knows that your mind is like any other, any other muscle in your body. But you don't have to be a world champion to learn how to train it. Calm can help you train your brain so you sleep better, reduce stress, and perform at your best. Listen, sleep is a critical part of your mental fitness routine. So head over to calm.com slash locked on NBA for a limited time. You'll get 40% off a calm premium subscription. You'll have access to nature scenes like rain and leaves and so much more like sleep stories and meditations. So you can be ready for any challenges that life throws at you again for a limited time. My listeners can join calm by uh, and get that 40% discount on a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash LockedOnNBA. Unlock content to help you focus, ease stress, and sleep better. Get started at calm.com slash LockedOnNBA. That's calm.com slash LockedOnNBA. All right. So we talked about a tough loss to the New Orleans Pelicans. Just a bad loss. Just a straight-up bad loss. Um, 
I'm not someone who believes in like the idea of momentum, but the Blazers, um, if they were building momentum off those two wins and off a nice road win in Memphis, this was the second game of a road trip. You had a night off before you're playing a Pelicans team that just straight up isn't very good, and you still find a way to wilt down the stretch. Not even find a way to wilt down the stretch. You just straight up wilt down the stretch. And this was coming off the heels of that game uh, on on Monday in Memphis, where where they looked pretty good, right? Like this was um, the Blazers needed to make plays down the stretch. Um, their defense was really good in the fourth quarter, holding the Grizzlies to, to 20, uh, 20 points. Some of that was was good luck. All of it is kind of some of it is luck based. You know, you give up an open three and they miss, or you give up a, like an un, a slightly un, unguarded three, more open than you want three and they miss. Um, that feels like better defense than you give up. You know. A, a, uh, slightly unguarded three, and they make it. I thought in the fourth quarter of this particular game against the Pelicans, they let Nikhil Alexander Walker get three, get free for just easy shots, for open shots. Um, and I think that's that's the problem is those early threes in the fourth quarter. He got a really clean look from the corner, a really clean look from the top of the, of the key. And like he's a dude who shoots almost every time he gets the ball. Like he's a chucker. You know I love chuckers, but like you let a chucker get a little confidence, you let him get a little rhythm, and then you pay the price. And the Blazers are paying the price. This has been a trend. And typically, like I said, the difference in good teams and bad teams is four or five minutes in a game. And most NBA games are close uh, or relatively in striking distance. Most teams don't get blown out. It's, you know, your margin for error is three, four possessions. That's why it's a couple minutes. But the Blazers have been trending this way. Like I said, the Memphis game was an exception, not the, not like the general trend. In the past, the Blazers have been elite in, in, crunch time situations. Just fantastic. This year, they're the worst fourth quarter defense in the NBA. Now, that isn't too different from what they are like the fourth worst defense in all of the other minutes and the four, and when you, all of the other minutes include that fourth quarter defense, but in the fourth quarter, the Blazers have the worst defensive rating in the league. Uh, that's as I'm recording this on December 22nd. So it's just been who they are. But the problem is it wasn't always who they are. It's they weren't they weren't always they didn't always struggle to this to this extent. In fact, last season, part of their bread and butter, part of their part of the formula was that if they kept it close, despite being mostly a bad defensive team, you know, finished 29th overall in defense, that they were good enough when the game was on the line to win. Last season, during the 2020-2021 seasons, uh, you may recall, <laughs> they packed three NBA seasons into, into one calendar year, but uh, l- last season, the Blazers were in, in clutch, clutch time, according to NBA.com stats. The Blazers, which is games that are within five minutes, within five points in the final five minutes, the Blazers were 24 and 13 in those minutes, and they had the top-ranked offense in the league in the clutch, but they also had the third-best defense in the NBA in the clutch. They were just good. They were good. Like, they were good on both sides of the ball. They were, you know, that's 37 games, so I think it's enough to say that it's not luck. Always it's like a small window, so there's some noise in the stats because you're just talking about, you know, makes and misses in a very specific part of the game. But when it, when you build it out to 37 games, there's some real truth to, like, at winning time, the Blazers were a team that figured out a way to win. Some of that is just as simple as Damian Lillard was really, really stinking good. And in the fourth quarter against the New Orleans Pelicans, he wasn't very good. In fact, he got a tech for complaining with two minutes and 12 seconds left. I missed this in the fastest recap in the West. It's right here in my notes, and I still missed it. Um, and then with a, a second and a half left, he w- he went and made sure he got ejected. It, the game was over. Uh, he was pissed. He went and told the ref, uh, went back for more to make sure he got his piece in and got ejected, his first ejection of, of the season. It kind of continues a trend where we are seeing angry Damian Lord come out much, much more often at the national media, at the local media, now at the referees. Um, this season is wearing a little bit on Dame. And like, you know, that's 13 and 19. That's, <laughs> that's the first 32 games that feels like it. And I think it's it's not maybe not a surprise that Dame is um, as frustrated as he is, but um, this year the Blazers in uh, in clutch are, are in the cl- in clutch games are just five and eight. I will note that the New Orleans Pelicans game does not qualify the way he, the way the NBA does it as a game that was within the clutch. The Blazers were down one with uh, about seven and a half minutes left, and then just above the five minute mark, they were down six and never got closer. So technically, this game doesn't even fall in these numbers, right? Like it doesn't even fall within the numbers. But the Blazers, you know down down one with six minutes and 57 six minutes and 52 seconds left and they and they lose by 14 i think you could do the math there outscored by 13 points in the final seven minutes 
not particularly clutch. This it doesn't like it doesn't fall in these numbers, but I think these numbers encapsulate kind of what we saw against New Orleans this season, from first last year to twenty fourth on offense. They just don't they don't have it. It's not apples to apples, and I, I I don't don't mean to really suggest that it is. But CJ McCollum missed a whole big chunk of games last year. He's missing games this year too, and the Blazers were still good in the clutch. Like you remember that game in Chicago where they just straight up stole it. You know. Dame hits a three, Gary Trent Jr. forces a jump ball, Dame hits another three, peace out, um, paint it, in the words of Jordan Kent. Um, like, they they were still a really good clutch team without C.J. McCollum. It's not apples to apples because you don't have uh, Carmelo Carmel Anthony. Like, I don't think you have that offensive punch off the bench. But you are you have a little bit better defensive personnel. Uh, Anthony Simons is better than he was a year ago, et cetera, et cetera. They shouldn't be one of the bottom six offenses in the league in, in crunch time. Also, some of it is just Dame hasn't been nearly as good. Um, you know, he's playing through this injury. Um, seems like he's going to continue to do so. And so I don't want to say like every time he plays poorly, oh, he's hurt. I don't think that's fair to him. Um, I don't think it's fair to sort of the analysis of the sort of fair level analysis I want to give to the team. But it is what it is. He's having one of the worst shooting seasons of his career. Uh, by volume, the worst shooting season of his career. He's been really stinking good the last three games. Day back. But like um, the the overall numbers for the season encapsulate Dame's struggles. 24th in offense in clutch situations, 5 and 8. They were 24 and 13 in those same games last year. Through the first 13 games, they've already lost eight times. And the Pelicans game doesn't even count. They would be 5 and 9 if it would, you know, we're talking about a point difference in tracking this. Like, that's why I said I think it encapsulates it more than it's captured here but statistically. They're also 21st in defense in the clutch. That's actually better than they are overall in defense, right? Like, they're slightly improved in clutch situations. Again, we're talking really small sample sizes and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, Bottom 10 in both offense and defense, that's how you lose these games. They just need, you know, Dame needed some help. He wasn't, you know, he was maybe out of gas or just or just missing shots late and frustrated because of it. But it's why you need, you know, some a little more variety, a little more punch. He needed a little more help. And the big one for me here, the big number that I kind of circle here when I'm looking at the clutch stats is I think offensive and defensive rating are fine. Like, we can point to them and kind of get it. I think you see it more than the numbers indicate. Like, they don't. I personally, for one, the one podcaster here rec- recording from my parents' home, literally my childhood bedroom, if you're watching on YouTube, um, no longer that, but uh, have, I haven't lived here in 20 years, but uh, it's, um, you know, it's like, for, in my opinion, you can see it more than the numbers. Like, you can just watch it, and you know, like, they're not, they don't look like they've got a good good offensive flow often in the fourth quarter. Um, they There's times when Norman Powell puts his head down and makes it happen. There's times when Dane makes it happen. There's times when when the, when the shots go in, it feels a little bit better. But they, they don't... Um, they don't have the same flow that they did. But also last year, they just didn't pass the ball. And here's one of the trick about not passing the ball. You don't turn it over much. And the number I found that really sticks out to me um, is that uh, they're turning the ball over literally twice as much in the clutch than they were a season ago. Last year, the lowest turnover rate in the NBA in clutch time, 7.3. The only 7% of their possessions ended in turnovers. They just got a shot off every time down the floor. And when you have shooters like they had last season with, um, you know, Dame and CJ and Carmelo Anthony and Norm and Gary Trent Jr., depending on what time of the season, and Anthony Simons and whatever it was, you get a shot off, you get give yourself an opportunity, you're going to do it. This season, this season, fourteen point five in turnover percentage, uh, slightly below average. Not near the not near the absolute bottom, but uh, you know, in the bottom below average, eighteenth, I believe, in, in turnover percentage, according to my notes here. Um, fourteen, it's twice as many turnovers. Fourteen, almost fifteen, or fourteen percent of their possessions end in turnovers. They just don't give themselves an opportunity. Some of that is because the style has changed a little bit. They're sharing the ball more. And every time you pass the ball, you have an opportunity for it to be turned over. Some of the aesthetics of the offense last season um were not particularly promising, but they did they, you know, they or they didn't feel great. But like you don't turn the ball over. You give yourself an opportunity. And I think that's a big part of this is that they've turned the ball over more. They certainly simplified the offense late. They're running a lot less stuff. Um, they're just, they, Dame's comfort zone is spread pick and rolls and they are running spread pick and rolls. They have, they have gone back to more sort of playground read and react stuff. They were running a lot more stuff earlier in the year and the offense was struggling. The offense is, it's been a little bit better as of late. Some of that is just Dame's been better as of late, but the, 
we are the the offense has devolved back into Dame's comfort zone. He wants to spread pick run spread pick and rolls, and sometimes that's awesome because Dame is incredible. But you it has some drawbacks, and particularly if on nights where the other sort of one on one scores. Ant, who was not good against Spelgan, straight up bad game for Ant, and Norm aren't on it. Like if 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 Ant's making shots like he did against in a crucial fourth quarter stretch against the Grizzlies, it just feels and looks different. Tonight he didn't. Ha- it's last night. I'm recording this Wednesday morning. Like he didn't have it. Um, and it 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 is it is what it is. Like you 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 see it. Like you see that Dame needs a little bit of help. And I think um, some combination of Dame's comfort zone on offense and his shooting struggles and then the randomness of any given night of who else is going to help has put them in the spot where they're a bad offensive team or bad offensive team in the clutch. And then the turnover stuff is just like, you you know, you they turn the ball over way more this year than they have. And that's that's all leading to it. And that's you know, it's not all of their struggles. Some of their struggles are just just defensive stuff. Some of their struggles are just, you know, that they they might not have the defensive talent to really get stops when they need it, and they're really dependent on being a good offensive team. And the difference between an elite offensive team and a pretty good offensive team is a loss for them because their margin for error on the defensive end, because of their defense, their margin of error on the offensive end is pretty slim. Um, but I think these clutch numbers help illustrate what what it is for this team. In close games, they just haven't been as good as they need to be. And that's that's why they are where they are. I thought the Pelicans game was pretty deflating because I thought they played well the last two games. And we're going to give them a chance to, you know, sweep a road trip, win a couple road games in a row, um, the you know, beat a bad team in their arena and head back and play some version of the Brooklyn Nets at home before Christmas, you know, put themselves in okay spot with, you know, Brooklyn and Dallas, two teams that have, uh, have a bunch of guys out due to COVID and injuries um, in a position to, get back on track and instead he you know instead the final seven minutes against a bad team went south they're outscored by 13 points in final seven minutes and their their woes at crunch time continue and here they are we're having another bummer podcast i was ready for some wins and the way that the podcast worked the timing we only got one win we only got one show for two wins Blazers got to hook your boy up. I'd love to podcast about wins. I'd love to have episodes to celebrate wins. Dame back. I would, can I just yell Dame back again? I can't because I got to keep it real with y'all, which means in the in the fourth uh, fourth quarter, <laughs> I've screwed up the transitions to the final segment a couple times in a row. I am also struggling in the clutch. Maybe it's rubbing off on me. Um, in the final segment, third segment, I want to close out the show talking about kind of what's happening in the league, um, the COVID, the COVID situation with the league, and what's sort of moving forwards happening in the NBA. Um, I want this to be a place with less bummers, but I also want to be this place where we kind of face the reality of the league that we're talking about here. So let's talk about the situation with the league. What's going to happen as we head into Christmas Day and we head into January and the struggles that the league is facing? Before we do that, let me tell you about BetOnline.ag the fastest and easiest place to bet on all your sports action more lines more odds more props than you than they've ever had before and on every sport the nfl which is heading into this playoffs college football which is squarely in the middle of bowl season or the nba's regular season uh also the nhl also combat sports also uh soccer or footy depending on where you are um you can also play your favorite vegas casino game so go to betonline.ag put in the promo code locked on and you'll get a 50 percent welcome bonus when you are making your first deposit that's promo code locked on for a 50 percent welcome bonus on betonline.ag that's betonline where the game starts Today's show is also brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market. I've been telling you all about about Built Bars for a long time. I've also been enjoying Built Bars for a long time, my own self. Listen, they make uh, a whole bunch of flavors, some classics like my favorites, like cookies and cream or peanut butter brownie, but there's always new flavors, particularly all winter long when they seemingly are rolling out new flavors all the time, including right now, uh, Candy cane brownie. If you go to built.com, you can get a limited time flavor candy cane brownie. It's kind of like a plussed up version of the uh, of the mint brownie. A little more fun. Uh, it's a little more seasonal, a little more fun, but it rocks. So go ahead and get it. But they're doing this all the time. They're coming out with limited time flavors. So if you check built.com regularly, you can find something new that you like, or you could hit up the old classics. Whatever you're into, 17 to 18 grams of protein in these bars, 130 to 180 calories, four to five grams of sugar, and just five grams of net carbs. All tasty all healthy. Go get yourself some. Go to built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. You get 15% off your next order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. 
Still a pass for his point guard. Still Mike Richmond. You're still listening to Locked on Blazers. We did your fastest recap in the West. The Blazers lose 111-97 to the New Orleans Pelicans. We talked about the Blazers' struggles in the clutch. They just... The magic of last season just hasn't been rekindled. Last year, if the game got close, you knew the Blazers had a chance, and they had a darn good chance. They won, you know, two-thirds of those games in the clutch, and this year they're just 5-8. and eight. And, you know, if, if, we're, if the way that the league tracked it, they'd be 5-9 and nine after this Pelicans game. They just haven't been good down the stretch of games this year, and it's cost them. It's, it's the difference of good teams and bad teams is, is how you'd perform at winning time, and right now the Blazers have the profile of a bad team. But what I want to talk about right now is just sort of the state of the league. Uh, you know, there is there is just a reality of, of the league is that the COVID-19 and the Omicron variant is just, it is rapidly infecting the country. The NBA exists here and it's rapidly affecting us. And all of North America, Canada, not, not separate. And Canada has a basketball team where they've already changed the indoor capacity of, of, of who can go and watch Raptors games, et cetera, et cetera. Um, According to Baxter Holmes of ESPN, before December 14th, the single day high for NBA players entering into the health and safety protocols was five. But there have now been double digit additions in six of the past eight days. This was as of December 21st. Over that span, the past eight days, so December 15th or December 14th to the December 21st, 83 players entered in the health and safety protocols, an average of 10.4 a day. That's like tw- that's like twenty percent of the league in eight days. Um, the league's already changed up its rules with allowing for hardship um, hardship additions of mandatory hardship additions of players. If you get a if you get one player in the health and safety protocols, you're mandated to add someone uh, on a hardship exception, or like you're mandated to add another player. If you get two players, you're mandated to add three. It's like or three players, you're mandated to add two. Rather, it's. Um, you know, the league is just is going to press forward uh, it, for the cap stuff like it. And for teams like the Blazers, who are like obsessed with with getting out of the luxury tax, you can add players without it being um, without it being part of a cap hit. But I don't want to talk about the basketball stuff. Um, I mean, that's like maybe important if you're tracking the numbers, but like where we're at. And I think this is important just to acknowledge is that the NBA doesn't want to stop the like the league ownership doesn't want to stop and the players union doesn't want to stop. So they're going to press forward, whether that's, um, it's obviously unsafe. I think we can all say that, like a league where 20% of the league is infected, like regardless of what you kind of believe about, um, because I know it's like, unfortunately, like talking about public health is political, but um, like, I think it's unsafe to just knowingly infect people with with whatever, like, just like, I think we can all, we probably can't all agree, but I think many of us can agree that um, uh, like, knowingly allow people allowing players to go into a workplace where they're going to get sick is probably not a good plan. Um, it's like, it's just, it's just not a, like a good health, the like public health, um, approach, but also like the league doesn't want to stop. They're going to press forward. So they're going to press forward with substitute players and rosters that are, um, you know, look a lot different and have a whole bunch of G leaguers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, they don't, they they don't want to push forward for these sort of obvious financial reasons. Um, if they if they renege on their uh, their television obligations, they're going to lose money. Um, if they stop having fans in arenas, they're going to lose money. If they pause the the um, if they pause the season again, uh, they are liable to lose money because a restart doesn't make doesn't really make you know, timing wise, they're going to go up against other stuff. And you push the NBA season into the summer, you're going to lose television ratings, et cetera, et cetera. And like the sort of financial and and logistical viability of running another bubble for instead of just, uh, you know, 16 teams or whatever it was, or 24 teams, whatever it was, but all 30 um, was, it it just just isn't realistic now. Um, Also, like, just as a, like, logical thing, like, I don't think shutting down the league right now, like, this, specifically this week, and sending everyone home for Christmas is going to cut down on viral transmission. Um, You send everyone home for Christmas, you're going to come back with more people testing positive. It's just, like, the nature of of where we're at with an endemic uh, virus running through the country. Like, it's just... um, it's just the the sort of hard truth of it. So, like, I don't have any takes um, 
I'm not a public health professional. Um, my older sister is. I could I could go ask her. She's also home for the holidays. But like, um, uh, it's the league has the league has sort of drawn its line, right? They're going to press forward with this, and they're going to continue to play this season. They, uh, Adam Silver, NBA commissioner, spoke with Malik Andrews of ESPN. Also, UP graduate, go pilot. Shout out to the University of Portland and uh, Portland's own. Um, she's not from Portland, but she went to college here. Uh, Malika Andrews, who's, who's an absolute blossoming into a real media star, um, but like did a pretty darn good interview with with Adam Silver and and asked him some tough questions, including the one that I was most curious about, which is like the the NBA is going to ramp up testing in January, but they're not doing it this week. And part of the reason I think they're not doing it this week, or I I know I don't I like don't have it, but I know because of logic, um, is that. If they start testing more, they're going to find more cases and they're going to have to cancel the games on Christmas. And they really, 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 really do not want to do that. This is not the week they want to postpone. Christmas is the NBA showcase. It's worth probably a billion dollars on television. Like it's it's huge money for the league and the money is going to dictate their health approach. Their approach to public health will be dictated by cash. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in. That's just the truth. Um, it's... It is what it is. I think the sort of where where we're gonna land is that the 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 big the big problem is not maybe protecting players. Um, I think increased testing and more isolation and 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 um, you know and eventually like people. I mean, unfortunately, eventually a whole bunch of the league is going to have had COVID and maybe that will um, you know and between having had COVID and being vaccinated, being boosted, you know, like really reduce the amount of transmission there is in, in like within the players, within the fraternity of like of the league itself. But if you're going to play in full stadiums with 20 to 20 to 25,000 people, um, you're just going to like the NBA is going to play the NBA either on the court or in the arena is going to be a place where COVID spreads. And um, the league is basically saying that they're sort of willing to do that. I think there's maybe some, future where like local municipalities decide that having big crowds in arenas is not a good plan, but I, the, the NBA is not going to do that. So they're just going to press on. Like I said, I don't really have takes. I just want to like, like that means cancellations. That means watching NBA teams with one regular player in the lineup and a whole bunch of, uh, and a whole bunch of replacement players. Now, um, some of that's pretty fun. I, I watched the end of the Dallas Mavericks game last night. Like this is, and like Theo Pinson and Marquise Chris were playing, you know, big minutes for a Mavericks team. Now the optics of why they're playing is gross and scary. And like I said, maybe amoral because like exposing people to a virus at work is maybe not like a <laughs> knowingly doing that is maybe not like a, an, like a really safe, like a really good thing. But like, some of it is they'll just press forward and you'll get to see backups play and you might enjoy the backups, et cetera. The Blazers have avoided this for now, but I think it's inevitable that it comes to the, the Trailblazers. Like, I think it's it one way or another, it will impact the team in the future. It hasn't thus far, but it's just, it's just the nature of it. It will at some point. So I guess all of this is to say, like, the next month of the NBA is going to be very strange. Uh, it's going to be very odd. Um, it might on some nights feel wrong and bad. And I think that's like a reasonable thing for it to feel. And it might on some nights to feel just like backwards that they're pressing forward, but the league isn't going to change. It just means they're going to, you know, Adam Silver made it clear in that interview with Malik Andrews is like that they don't, nobody in this, nobody in the NBA ecosystem wants to, to pause or cancel or, or, or slow down the season. They want to push forward. And so they're going to do it. And so, to me, what like the sort of what we're the lesson is here is like this thing is going to be full steam ahead and it's going to look weird and might feel weird. And I think we have to, as a listening and viewing public, if you're listening to the podcast and watching the games, um, have to decide kind of where we stand on that. Um, I'm not going to make some crazy moral grandstand and boycott the league or whatever, but like I don't, I'm not going to feel great about it. Um, to be clear, uh, I'm also not going to spend long segments talking about it here. I want to talk about it once um, because I feel like I owe it to you, dear listener, to um, look at the elephant in the room and say, yeah, I see the elephant. Let's talk about it. But um, like, it's just, it is what it is. It's reality of the league. It's a bummer. It's reality of our world. Um, it's, it's, it's sad. I'm over it. Like I'm, 
I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do it in my everyday life. I don't want to do it in whatever, but it's just like the reality of where we are, um, the unfortunate reality of, of our times. And the MBA is no different, and they're going to deal with it. And the way they're going to deal with it is the way I think that a lot of society is, is to plow forward and hope that some of your mitigation practices work, but um, with also, also the admission that some of them won't work and that you'll just have to deal with the consequences from there. And I think the next month is we will find out what those consequences look like because the league is going to press forward and they're going to play these games on Christmas almost certainly. And uh, that's that. The Blazers play on, on uh, December 23rd. Uh, they're going to play the Brooklyn Nets who have dealing with injuries and a whole bunch of people in health and safety protocols. They're going to play some of the Brooklyn Nets. Um, then they'll have a couple days off and then they're going to play the the Mavericks who have a bunch of injuries and COVID stuff too. And we'll see who they have available by the time we get there. No reason to speculate now if four or five days in advance. But like this part of watching the league and previewing games is literally checking the health and safety list for the league. It's the protocol list for the league because it's just the reality of it. So everybody out there, if you're listening, I appreciate you. Stay safe. Do your best to stay safe. Keep your loved ones safe. Whatever that might mean to you, whatever that looks like. Um, one day this won't, hopefully this won't be a reality, but for now that's where we are. Um, I know this is kind of a bummer episode, but um, we'll do some positivity. I'm going to bring heavy positivity at the end of the season. I'm loading up the optimism cannon. And while I'm maybe not optimistic about the Blazers, I'm willing to either fake it for y'all or talk about something else that makes me more optimistic because we need less bummers in our lives. Do me a favor. Tell your friends about this podcast. They can get it wherever they're already listening to podcasts or on YouTube. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. I truly appreciate it. And come back for more. More, sh more shows later this week. So make sure you're joining us. The only Daily Trailblazers podcast. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.